Brian Hannon is the cultural curator of Elmas Chat. I don't like calling him that. I don't. <laughs> I I don't know what to call him yet. Okay. Um. What's up? What's up? What's up, everybody? Welcome to LMS Chat. Um. I am one of your hosts, Kenny, and with me, as always, is my amazing co-host, Milka Moret. How are you, Milka? I am doing well. How are you, Kenny? I'm doing fine myself. My back hurts. Let's just get that out of the way. So if y'all see me moving like this, disclaimer. My back hurts. So anyway, Milka, how's your back? Your back? Honestly, my back has been pretty good as of lately, you know? I love that for you. I also love this new... (laughs) I was going to say this new art for you. I'm actually really feeling it. Wow. I think that's the old piece, this other new piece. It's it's doing something. This is a very... um, reflective of today's weather. I don't know what was going on today, if you guys were in the DMV area, but it was like great weather and like weird weather. Like I felt like the wind was just kind of speaking to me. Leaves uh, everywhere, dark. Next year's LMS chat, we'll definitely have to bring in DC weather. Just to be like, yeah. <laughs> what did you mean by this question? Um, I think, uh, let's just go get it, get in, into intros though, because don't want to waste any time so with me like i said is my amazing amazing co-host milka mered um she is from northern virginia she always almost sprays perfume on right before lms chat um and her favorite holiday food is my mom's lasagna pumpkin pie and it it says jello it really means cranberry sauce but you're just saying without the cranberries but yeah. that's still cranberry sauce, you know? No, because you never know if you're going to get the quality cranberry sauce. Like, I don't want cranberry shells just everywhere. Like, I feel like saying Jello though, just immediately my head is in the wrong place. I'm not ready <laughs> to receive cranberry sauce. Um, I think we know what Brian Hannon's uh, favorite food is. Fud, fud. But, you know, life goes on. I don't even know what that is. I'm going to keep it a bug. Am I... <laughs> Wow. You should know what that is. I should know. I should know. We can all agree that I should know. Um, yeah. <laughs> but alongside me is my co-host and colleague, Kenny Carroll. And on the topic of DC weather, currently, Kenny's uh, hair is wet. His pants are wet. His shoes are wet. And while all of that is going on, his favorite holiday food is sweet potato pie. So also you- made by my mom, I think. Oh, see, mom's cooking. It's it's something about the moms where it's like <laughs> moms are the best, and uh, their food is always the best. I'm gonna be honest. I didn't like my mom's lasagna though. If I I just want I just want to start fights. I only want to start fights today. I want problems only. Um, I think lasagna is a really hard dish to do right. I don't. Know if that's a controversial. For any lasagna, lasagna making the I think it's a lot. It's a lot of pasta. It's a lot of cheese. And I think you just gotta. You didn't come here for lasagna, or did you? <laughs> um. So real quick, let me also get some other stuff out of the way. Um. And welcome you. To... Oh, hello from Tokyo. What's up? And Inter- we're international now. Um. So uh, this is LMS Chat. Welcome. Um. This is in collaboration with LMS Voice. Um. LMS Voice. Uh, dot com. If you go there, you can find a bunch of workshops, uh, a bunch of workshops for students, a bunch of workshops for adults, a bunch of workshops for whoever is interested in poetry or writing. They are all free. Um, and during our commercial break, we'll be showing you a little bit how the site looks. Um, so feel free to go there, do the things. You can find a uh, workshop built around this poem that we're going to be talking about today. So that's LMS Voice. Um, yeah, also we have live captions on. Oh, do wait, do we? We should, but I may have hit them on accident. Give me one second. Um, in one second, we're gonna have live captions on. Yeah, and of course, okay, bet. And of course, uh, somebody already asked in the chat, you will be able to watch these over again. We have a bunch of amazing artists that we got to interview, um, such as Safia El Hillo, Sarah Kay, um, Patricia Smith, Clint. Patricia Smith. Thank you. you. That's why I need a co-host. That's why I need, that's why I need you, Milton. You're great. Um, yeah, amazing people. So you can go watch those at LMS Chat or at, at LMS Voice. 
it is the end of the day. I work eight hours today. Um, Milka, am I forgetting anything? You are. So for those of you that are new to LMS chat, uh, just to run through of what kind of happens, we start introductions and then we um, bring our amazing guest, which we are so lucky to have Elizabeth Acevedo tonight. Um, uh, she'll read her poem and we'll dive into our first section, which is uh, poetry specific questions. Um, and then we'll move on to our culture section where we kind of uh, analyze a lot of the work that she does in her profession. Um, in a more holistic sense. And then at the end, we get to my favorite part, which is chop it up. And we'll kind of ask her some quick fire, fun uh, brain teaser questions. And I know I'm super excited to have her with us. Kenny, how are you feeling? I'm, I'm feeling good. Besides my back hurting, I am <laughs> super excited for this. Um, such a huge fan. Real quick, I think the last thing before we just get into reading her bio, is we want to lift up because it's November, it's Indigenous History month so shout out um all my indigenous folks am i small i feel like did i i feel like did our pins go away are we just one of the people we need to be pinned i i hate this for us um bam okay 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 and wow now it's us um but we want to lift up uh because we are in the dmv the piscataway and the anacostia people um yeah because this is not our land um, and this is just where we're staying. So uh, thank you to that. Happy Indigenous History Month. Um, I think that's everything now. I think now we've done everything. Now we're super excited to bring on Elizabeth Acevedo. So mm -hmm. Elizabeth Acevedo is the New York Times bestselling author of The Poet X, which won the National Book Award for Young People's Literature, the Michael L. Print Award, the Pura Bel Pre Award, the Carnegie Medal, the Boston Globe Horn Book Award, and the Walter Award. She's also the author of With the Fire on High, which was named a Best Book of the Year by the New York Pub Public Library, NPR, Publishers Weekly, and School Library Journal, and Clap When You Land, which was a Boston Globe Horn Book Honor Book and Kirkus finalist. She holds a BA in Performing Arts from the George Washington University and an MFA in Creative Writing from the University of Maryland. Acevedo has been a fellow of Cave Canem, Cantamundo, and a participant in the Kailalu Writers Workshop. She's a National Poetry Slam champion and resides in Washington, D.C. with her love. And I'd be remiss if I didn't just shout out the amazing look. I'm from D.C., and I'm very proud of that. Um, and it, for a long time, I thought Liz was just from D.C. because that's how, like, in D.C. she is. But um, one of the most inspiring people, I, I think, in my life and a lot of my friends and like, you know, poetry family's life. Um, and now also I feel like one of the most like important writers we have now. So we're so honored and lucky to be bringing to the stage. Uh, Y'all can start clapping in your little boxes now. Uh, Elizabeth Acevedo. Hi, I'm so hyped to be here with you all. Thank you for having me. Of course. I Is Liz small now? I feel like- um, I'm pulling her up, I'm pulling her up. <laughs> okay, okay. I love how I feel like a crazy. I ain't never small, Kenny. Don't do that. Don't be serious. <laughs> Why would I reduce a voice like that? Look at me. Cancel me. I'm done. I'm done. Um, but yeah, we would love it if um you could just maybe start by reading the poem that we have and yes. talk so from there. The poem that we're going to be discussing is from the Poet X, and um. Fun fact, which I think some of some folks may know if they've been studying or paying attention to my work or my my talks, that this poem was directly taken from my high school journal. So when I talk about revision or what it means to hold on to work until you find a home for it, even if that's decades later, um, this is often the poem I refer to. And, and I'm going to read both the Spanish and the English. If you have a copy of the Poet X, I'm reading from 233. If you don't, I will be reading nice and slow. Um, so you get those auditory listening skills up, or if you need the visual, hopefully the live captions will hold you down. A poem mommy will never read. Mi boca no puede escribir una bandera blanca. Nunca será un verso en la Biblia. Mi boca no puede formarse el lamento que tú dices que tú y Dios merecen. Tú dices que todo esto es culpa de mi boca, porque tenía hambre, porque era callada, 
pero, y la boca tuya, como tus labios son grapas que me perforan rápido y fuerte, y las palabras que nunca dije quedan mejor muertas en mi lengua, porque solamente hubieran chocado contra la puerta cerrada de tu espalda. Tu silencio amuebla una casa oscura, pero aún a riesgo de quemarse, la mariposa nocturna siempre busca la luz. In translation. My mouth cannot write you a white flag. It will never be a Bible verse. My mouth cannot be shaped into the apology you say both you and God deserve. And you want to make it seem like it's my mouth's entire fault because it was hungry and silent. But what about your mouth? How your lips were staples that pierced me quick and hard. And the words I never say are better left on my tongue since they only would have slammed against the closed door of your back. Your silence furnishes a dark house. But even at the risk of burning, the moth always seeks the light. Thank you. Oh my God, give, give it up. Yeah, I feel like people were already clapping before I even said anything. Um, yeah, it's funny. I think this is the most people we've had in the chat before too. So yeah, feel free, make the chat all claps. Um, also Liz, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Um, yeah, I think one place we, I, or I like to start, we like to start um, when we have, like, right after we have poets read a poem, it's just starting with, like, how does it feel coming back? Um, and is this a poem that you come back to often? Um, I use this poem as an example often, so I do return to it. I think it is an odd relationship when you collaborate with your younger self or when you plagiarize your younger self, right? Because <laughs> on one hand, you're like, dang, I was dope. Like, <laughs> <laughs> ours, right? And then at the same time, you're like, dang, am I whack now if I'm still referring back, you know? And so it's this mix of where does the ego go? And so even when I'm reading it out loud, there's a little bit of negotiation with wanting to edit, wanting to um, lift the poem to maybe where I am now that I, you know, in 2018, when this book was published, I wasn't in 2016 when the book was sold or in 2006, when I first wrote the poem, right? That there's always a constant wanting to one up myself. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's interesting to have to leave something kind of concrete, especially since I invited you all to read with me, right? <laughs> so I can't be out here modifying in midair, but, but this relationship with my past constantly comes up, I think, when you're reading old work, right? How do I sit with this? What about this still rings true? What about this um, is uh, still reverberating? And what would I write differently? Uh, definitely comes up for me. Yeah, I, so I think I have two kind of questions. I think maybe the first one is you kind of already mentioned that this was a poem you pulled from your high school book or from your high school writing. Uh, I guess like why? Or I, and I know, and I think we can talk about like how it serves the Poet X as a larger book, but also like, I think it's really interesting as a poet or as a writer going back to your old writing and doing anything besides just like, what was I doing? Yeah, what yeah. Is <laughs> But you know, I think, so one, I'll start at the top. Um, I, I was writing the Poet X and I really did use my high school journal as a way of calibrating, right? That was my almost sacrificial goat, if you will, if we're going to talk in slam terms, that I constantly was checking, how did I write? What did I write? Where were my feelings? Like, so often I think people are quick to dismiss um, young people's feelings as teen angst or just hormones or, or puberty, et cetera. And so I didn't want to fall into the trap of being dismissive of a voice I was trying to replicate. And for me, the most honest way to do that was, well, let me go sit with my work. What were the metaphors I was using? How was I holding what felt so big? And where was I maybe even yanking on sentimentality even at that age? And so I think it allowed me to kind of uh, match my voice um, and push my voice in certain ways, right? And again, talking about ego, like, oh, I don't want to be using, you know, certain lines, but it's like the, the character I'm writing doesn't have an MFA. She hasn't read, you know, Aurora Brown. She may not, she may not be where I'm at necessarily, and that's okay. I need her to be um, as good as, as I'm claiming her to be in the book, and that's going to be her own version and her own style, and 
I kind of had to forgive myself for the ways that I wanted to um, almost compete with my character, right? Like I was making her slam against me in a way that wasn't always fair. And so I think that checking my own work against what I was currently writing was, was super helpful for me, right? And, and just making sure that I was honoring that age. No, that's real. And I, I think- You gotta reach your word count. You know what I mean? And like steal <laughs> this way to oh, work. Work. Like, let's be honest. <laughs> I, that's hilarious. Um, but the, the second part of what I had wanted to ask, I think was like pulling it from uh, like your high school journal. We know like you were holding back while making a lot of edits. Did like, I think even looking at the poem, it like looks pretty. And it's also not like, I definitely know like in high school, I wasn't writing in like, kind of neat stanzas so yeah. like were there things besides like maybe just cutting out whole parts or like adding stuff that you edited like when you decided to put it in oh yeah for sure for sure I mean I think that there's a way when I was writing um I was writing I was editing with my ear I wasn't as concerned with what things looked like on the page because my assumption is that my poetry at that age wasn't existing outside of my body so all I needed to do was write matching my breath so a line would end when I would need to take a breath or when I needed the rhythm or the pattern, right? So a lot of my early poetry, I think, was um, was ear edited and also rhythmic. And I was already thinking of what my body would do. Putting a poem like that in the novel, I did have to rethink where the line breaks going to make sense. Um, there were probably a couple words that I changed with it was it had a lot more mixed metaphors and just kind of trying to stay in the house a little bit longer trying to um, kind of navigate the poem in that way. I, I remember kind of having to pull out some, some language that just, you know, you're excited when you're young and you just got bars and you're like, I'm gonna just throw every metaphor that's really great in here. And so I had to kind of come in and be like, what's, what's gonna hold the moment, but also further the plot, right? That now I'm taking into account a character, a plot um, and, and the more cohesive, what is the imagery that has been throughout the entire novel? not just my, my journal and what, what sounds good to me when I'm my only listener. And so there was a different kind of editing process that I had to undergo. And I, I like to think of it almost as offerings, right? Like I gave myself these offerings from my younger self, right? And so I, I do hold that kind of um, really lovingly, you know, like I'm not out here like this was trash list. Like I'm still a smart <laughs> editor, but but it was it was with a lot of almost nostalgia and real kindness. Like, dang, little Liz was really out here with feelings. You know? Like, <laughs> you know, like there's a lot of tenderness in 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 doing this work, and I think I was tender with the editing. You know, um, when I was reading the poem, right? Like it it seems very um, obvious that there's this frustration that the protagonist has with God and um, her mother and so like something that I was really thinking about was you know like when the book was released did these did like poems like this like did it spark conversations or reactions from people in your community your social circle people closest to you you know how was that like <laughs> I mean this I think my writing has always been interesting um because my upbringing is one where my parents primarily speak Spanish and didn't really speak a lot of English, I was really free. Am I back? Oh yeah, yeah you're back. just cut off just a little bit. Wow, we were all holding our breath on that. <laughs> <laughs> my phone and my watch. So if anything, I'll, I'll check the upstairs, but um, shoot, what was I saying? You're saying that your family speaks um, sp primarily Spanish and then? Yes, Milka, come through, come through with that. Yes. It's gotta so, be Milka. <laughs> my family primarily speaks Spanish. So I got to be really brave as a young person because I was protected because they wouldn't understand. So I could mm. write about my family, I could write about my girl, I could write about religion and get away with a lot because who's translating this? Not I, I said the cat, right? So like, I'm good. And so the poet X comes out, it comes out in English. My mom is uber Catholic. Um, I know there was going to be stuff she wasn't going to like, but I'm like, all right, this is okay. Then the book got published in Spanish and I'm like, okay, okay, okay. Like I'm a girl my loins. Like I'm brave now. I'm a grown up. We can talk about these things. And my mom got her copy and she's reading it. She's, she's texting me all of a sudden, everything is about WhatsApp. She's sending me these WhatsApp messages and then it's radio silence. 
And the next day she sends me a message. She's like, Ailey, I finished the book. And that was it. That was the whole message. And I'm like, nothing else. Like my mom just finished my first thing. And so I called her and I'm like, uh huh, mommy, what happened? She's like, well, I don't know if your aunts can read it. And I'm like, oh, dang. like, you know, there's the masturbation scene. There's the way that they're talking about religion. The ending is in the air. There's all of this stuff. And she's like, yeah, because there's one poem where you mentioned the Eucharist and I just, I just couldn't. I just couldn't with the Eucharist. And I'm sitting here like, baby girl, do we know everything that happened? Like you read the whole thing and that was the part that... <laughs> So I think it's amazing to me how often and what I'm learning is that I have these ideas of how my family will react to my being very honest in the work. And the thing that they're often taking aback about isn't anything I can protect against, right? Like it's not even what I'm anticipating as what's going to be the kind of, you know, point of, of tension. And so <laughs> it was an amazing experience, I think, to kind of hold my breath. And then my mother's feedback is like, you didn't do that, right? Like you never put God's body under a bench. And I'm like, of course not. She's like, okay, fine, <laughs> right? But like, but it was this, <laughs> like, okay, the, the writing isn't the issue. Like there was something else to discuss, but I think it, it's been really exciting to have that experience with her. And more importantly, I, I, it's taught me so much about women who reach out or mothers who reach out and say they're reading it with their daughter and how it challenges them. My daughter came home from school with this book and I decided to read it alongside with her. And now we're having these intergenerational conversations. And when I think about what I hoped this book would do, I never thought it would be with me and my mom. And that's been special, but I also never thought it would be with mothers and their daughters in the moment where it's most critical to be having these conversations. And that feels like such a huge gift, you know, that this connection is happening through you know, sharing one story. Yeah, that's wrong. And uh, I, I'm much writing these questions. I was trying to keep them all like on this poem, but you know, it's a part of the book. It's like I find myself. So this is kind of a book question, kind of uh, uh, this poem question. But I, mm -hmm. I thought it was really interesting, kind of just like you mentioned, where it's like, you know, uh, Zio's character, like her mom speaks Spanish, but. Um, like is having a hard time with English. So I thought it was kind of interesting that the poem, and, and in my head, this is like my head canon. what happened. Like her mom read this poem, like the one poem that was in completely Spanish. And I just, <laughs> I was curious if like, like I guess one, I'm curious if, if in your high school journal, like was this written in Spanish? Like did it start in Spanish? Or was this something you translated after? And was Zio like a part of Zio? Like, mom's gonna read this one. This one's for you. <laughs> Call my mom. Can't I read. Call my mom. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna get back for 15 years ago. No. <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> no. I mean, I'm trying to think of. We'll start the question at the top because I answered the clapback question, but running back just so I know exactly. <laughs> So, so the first question was just like, was this something like coming out of your high school journal? Was it written in Spanish originally or did you translate it later? Yeah, no. So, so funny enough, the poem was written, a poem my mother will never read. And then it was written entirely in Spanish, which I don't write in Spanish. Um, I don't read in Spanish and I don't think you can write in a language you, you don't read in or, or don't partake storytelling in, right? Because mm -hmm. the, the structures, the vocabulary, the way that I understand imagery, at this point in my life is, is mostly English. It's how I see, right? I'm constantly trying to, how would I describe that? How would I say that? How would I capture this image? And the words are often English. And even at, at that age, that was, you know, I was consuming hip hop and books in English and going to poetry slams and that was the world I was in. So to write a poem in Spanish was actually, I think, slightly radical for me because it was the first time that I'm writing a, a poem directly about my mother in a language that if she picked up my notebook, she would be able to actually um, be able to read. It wasn't, you know, my Spanish wasn't most grammatically correct Spanish, but she would have understood it. And, and I also had the translation in English yeah. on the next page. Wow. The way it appears in this novel is the way it appeared in my journal. I wrote it almost as like, here's a letter to her. And then I wrote the version for myself, right? To, to make sure I'm saying what I mean to say for me knowing that she won't won't read this and so what was interesting about writing this novel 
is that the character felt really really different than my own upbringing. I was, I was out here. I wanted to be a rapper. I was jumping on everybody's stage. I was taking everybody's mic. Like I wasn't, see, Omada's a little bit more shy than I was. I was nervous, but I'm like, yo, I'm, I'm taking out Bow Wow. I'm taking out little Romeo. I'm taking out little <laughs> Romeo. <laughs> Bravado is real. And so I, I moved with that energy. So the character between myself and Siomara is really different. But there were moments in the conceptualizing of the book that I had to kind of say, what can I pull from that that feels real and feels honest and also is going to move this book in a way I haven't seen. And so there were things that did that. Getting caught kissing on the train was real. And I remember the day I was sitting here like, what can I write today? And then I was like, you know what would be wild? <laughs> right? And although the scene after, the way that Siomara gets punished is not how I got punished. You know what I mean? So there are moments I had to steal from memory and borrow from memory and got in trouble because I kissed on the train and my parents basically were, gave me the silent treatment. And so that poem was written in that moment, right? I live in a silent house. Your, house, your silence furnishes a dark house. This idea of I can't, I can't, you know, that's also a mixed sensory metaphor, but like, this is what you, you subscribe me to. This is how your punishment looks in that moment. And so I did pull certain pieces that felt juicy, you know, from my own upbringing and then like cushioned them with, with fantasy and with the story. And, and it, it feels amazing that a poem that otherwise would have never seen the light of day. I would have never published this poem. It's not going to end up in a collection. I'm not going to perform it. Yet here it found a home where it fits perfectly. And so I think that's, there's a beauty in how our past selves write forward, you know, and, or, or write in ways that we can, um, generate from oh, i think you're also just serving my inner child as well because i think there's some about like being heard like that where it's like yeah you was you was spitting um <laughs> <laughs> no that's beautiful i i do want to um we have more questions uh some questions sent in by y'all uh so i want to make sure we get time for those so now uh we're gonna give liz a check in a second words man they're hard sometimes a second to catch her breath because she was spitting fire so that's what i'm milka you always got my follow-up milka you always, <laughs> you always do um look so yeah we're gonna let liz uh catch their breath and uh we're gonna tell you a little bit about what's going on with lms voice real quick before milka um shows you a bunch of cool lms voice things uh <laughs> our sponsor i'm gonna learn to say their name Barini Hoyt. I think I said it right that time. Um, shout out them. Uh, if you want to be a sponsor, if you want to get sponsored on here, uh, I think you can message us at LMS Voice uh, and be like, hey, yo, you want some money? That's That that tagline will get anybody to read. Like whatever, whatever's after that in life. If it's just, okay, let me stop. Um, but we also want to lift up. Uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't lift up. Uh, this amazing artist we have here for you today. Uh, she's written a bunch of books, The Poet X, which if you don't have, what are you doing? Come on. Um, I not that that hard. Uh, the Fire on Hat, The Fire on High, Clap When You Land. Um, and if you want to follow what they are doing, you can find them at Acevedo Writes on Twitter and Instagram. I feel like they maybe use Instagram more, but also we're going to have their website, which is also AcevedoWrites.com. Um, Go follow them. They're doing amazing things. You wanna, you wanna know. You wanna know when something happens. Um, so I think, I think that's my part. Milka, you wanna tell people about the other thing? Yes, I. Do. I was just pasting our guests' info. You're the best. You'll never stop being the best, Milka, unless you do something different, and then you won't be the best anymore. <laughs> Threatening my job. You got it. Uh, so here is the website for LMS Voice. Um, I know some of you all sometimes have some difficulty finding the curriculum section, but the webpage is super awesome. It highlights things that we've done in the past, collaborators, um, just kind of all the work that we really do and we really are invested in um, uh, creating more inclusive spaces. Um, and so you can find workshops, free workshops, um, that features some of the works of our amazing guests, um, such as Elizabeth. So if you just kind of scroll down, you'll see um, samples of uh, 
some of the works that our guests are that poets um, around the country um, have created and we'll, we've created workshops. So let's say you want to look for um, some of Elizabeth's works. You can just scroll down to the poet section, look up Elizabeth, and then you'll see like, for example, in translation, the poem she read today. And on the webpage, um, we offer writing workshops, uh, uh, analytical lesson, essay materials, um, and um, questions uh, for educators to kind of incorporate in their classrooms uh, so that they can find neat ways to um, teach students and break down the content of um, poems uh, or of the poem uh, for them to kind of analyze some of the things that they discuss um, and the themes that they discuss. So it's super awesome. We put in a lot of work um, to craft this together. Uh, Brian Hannon is the mastermind um, behind this webpage and um, it is super awesome. And so uh, that is kind of a sample of what we do. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Uh, uh, quick question, um, Milka, how much does this service cost, would you say, overall? Like, so uh, just think about cost, taxi size. The cost of the, the uh, materials on the LMS curriculum right. uh, is free 99. What? Free 99. What are you in the back? Free 99. Very free. Um, hey, free. We're trying to make it more accessible. So this section of this, um, voice is something we really want to offer for educators because uh, this is really important. It's a way to get um, current poets in the classroom and a neat way for people of all backgrounds to kind of see themselves reflected. And there's they're um, divided up by age, gender, sexual orientation. Um, uh, race. And so if you're looking for a theme or a poem that uh, discusses a certain topic that's listed as well. Um, so yes, super awesome. And if you want to see your favorite poet, you come to um, LMS chat every month. Um, so that is a little bit about what we do. That was excellent. Okay. On top of it. I, I try to be tongue tied and everything. You're doing um, it. You're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> So now we are on to the second section of the night, the culture section, uh, which honestly doesn't differ from poetry. Honestly, they're all just great. So we're just gonna roll with the punches. But I think to start off, um, I kind of want to follow up to like you talking about some of the, the you pulling from your past experiences, Liz, um, and how you incorporate that in your writing. You know, like, so oftentimes like you're kind of going through and discussing taboo topics that or that may be taboo for some communities and cultures and um do these like cultural restraints do they ever impact your decision on whether to discuss a topic or does it impact how you write about it or are you just like i'm letting it rip you take it as is i do not censor when i am drafting and so when i'm first writing it's it's kind of like I'm just seeing what I have. I'm collecting all of the material and I'm just uh, seeing what I can build from the material. And I don't, I try my best not to allow the voice that's like, you can't say that, right? Because that voice comes up and I'm like, you can't write that, you can't say that. Or like, uh, what is your mother gonna think when she reads this? And I have to step back when I'm drafting um, and think I'm the first reader. What do I need to read to understand the story? Like what's the information that I'm going to take in? And then, you know, as I edit, I might choose um, what are the topics. I, I might narrow down how many topics I want to talk about or like this is still poignant, but maybe it's for a different book or this is poignant, but it might be for a poem. It might not be for this novel because for me to get this character from point A to point B, um, I have to kind of distill the experience that they're having, right? And so I, I have to be thoughtful to an extent, but I don't shy away from taboo subjects because of how they'll be received. I mean, I am learning more and more every day that my book is getting banned in uh, many different places. At this point, there are five different states that have ongoing um, issues in several different counties with either pulling the book that was on the shelf off the shelf or banning the book from ever entering the county or banning the book from being taught or banning the book from being a free choice book or banning the book from the local library system. And so I can't kind of um, concede to systems I can't control 
as to what they're going to consider taboo, right? That for me, I have to consider what did my students need to be reading? When I was an eighth grade teacher, what were the characters and storylines and subject matters that maybe no one was talking about? That a book was the only safe place where they could get an understanding of, um, of the nuance of a lot of these subjects. And, and so I, I protect that and that's it. You know what I mean? Like I protect that first. And if, if it feels true, if it feels honest, if I think I remember having this feeling, I remember my students telling me they had this feeling. I have to imagine other young people have this feeling. What service do I do by not presenting it? And that doesn't mean I don't present it thoughtfully. Not talking about the Poet X, but with the fire on high, right? I'm writing about a teen mom, not just a, a, a young woman or a young parent. Uh, or a young person who's gotten pregnant. There are a lot of YA novels, you know, where a young person gets pregnant. Will I, won't I have a baby? For me, I was very, very intentional. What happens once you already have the child? And how is that written about? And how do we say young people can't read that? Those are adult novels. And what do we say to young people who have children if they can't see themselves in these kinds of books, right? You have now removed yourself as a potential hero in any story ever. Right, and so I had to approach that subject with a real um, understanding of this is just taboo from Rip. From Rip, this is going to be something. From Rip, they told me we don't know if we could publish it. We don't know if, if that's going to work. We like they had all these reasons, and I had to kind of push ahead. And so I, I think I just I can't let myself get caught up with what the current climate or current moment or whatever particular region is feeling about a subject. I think that part of being an artist is knowing you have a point of view that might not be amenable to everyone and that that is okay. That is not my job to make this readable for absolutely everyone and make people comfortable when reading my books. I have no interest in comfort, right? Tenderness, yes. And tenderness for particular folks who often don't experience that in books, yes. But comfort, you know, and I think that that's what taboo is. It is outside of the comfort zone. That was super people. awesome. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add in, um, like, when I was looking through the submissions for questions, there was a student who said their school just beat a ban, so they were able to get the books back in. I'm so sorry I don't have your name, but if you're listening, shout out you. You did it. Um, you the only best. The reason that I've been able to push back is because young people have been like, yo, you can't take our books. And because of amazing educators and teachers and community members who are standing up against fear, right? And so for sure, shout out to that student and to that student school. That's amazing. Uh, you know, I try not to get involved because I think it can feel really overwhelming that you make a thing with so much love and then people say, yeah, this pollutes young minds. And knowing how I've I, knowing how thoughtful I am around my interactions with young people and why I write, it just, it, it's really hard on me. And so I, I just be like, you know, I put it in the world. That's on y'all to decide. It always kind of gives me a little joy when I'm like, look at the young people letting you know. Also, yeah, I think it was uh, Melissa Smith. So shout out you, Melissa, yeah. uh, you're the best. You're the best in the world. Oh, shout out to them for sure. Yo, they held me down, man. <laughs> Held me down. She holds Never say Melissa didn't hold Elizabeth Her. Acevedo down. Oh, um, that means the world. Okay, I okay. Know. All right. Yeah, I totally sidetracked the questions with that, but I just felt like it was like so in the way. Um, I, I mean, I think maybe a good follow up to that though is, um, and this was coming from the audience. Um, many of your books have inspired non readers to pick up books. What are your thoughts about your books being used in classrooms, either full class reads or by choice? And this is from Barry Bullisvert. I'm sorry if I'm fucking your name up. Uh, teacher at Sanborn Regional High School in Kingston, New Hampshire, I believe. I'm so bad at it. I, um, it means the world. I mean, I think, I don't know that the, as a teacher, right? I'm not sure that when I was putting together my, my unit, I approached it in the way that I did as a young person. As a young person, when someone put a book in front of me and they're like, this is the book we're going to read as a class, okay, the book is legit, right? Like it's canonized. It's accepted by the administration. There's going to be objectives based on this book. Often those books were very particular kinds of books, 
right? There's a, there's a credibility that classrooms give when we say there is something teachable in this language, in this culture, in this approach, right? In this writing style. And so I think it does a, a huge service when we talk about, you know, kind of rewriting the canon or allowing other people into what we consider American literature that happens when young people grow up thinking, oh yeah, I read Whitman and then I read Acevedo and then I read Reynolds and then I read Morrison and then I read Frost, that all these people are in the exact same shelf. I think it does something to how we then perceive the, the power dynamics of writers. And so there is a, 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 a onus, I think, on educators to be thoughtful of, of who they're bringing in because of the power that literally a teacher telling a student, read this, I think you'll learn something or read this, I think it's for you, that, that happens. So yeah, whenever I hear about projects or students reading the books, or even if it's an independent choice, like it means the world. I have a teacher friend, um, he's in Jersey, he teaches um, uh, special ed and he has this student and on Monday he sent me a picture and the student was at the top of the poet X and she's reading, she's on page three, she, she has a little plastic screen in front of her. I'm like, yay, she's reading the book. And today he sent me a picture. She was on a swing and she's swinging. And I saw the back cover, right? I saw the picture and I'm like, oh, she finished the book. <laughs> it's like journey I took with this kiddo. You know what I mean? And so the fact that she had access to that book because of this teacher, because of this classroom and, and loved it enough to finish it in four days. Like, yeah, like I never take that for granted. And so it, it, it means a lot. Like, yeah, someone picking it up at the library, of course. Someone picking it up at a bookstore, of course. But when it's like as a as a system, as an institution, or even as a teacher, there's something in this book that I think will connect to these students. So I'm going to use it as a way to, to open up larger themes or even just as an offering, like, yo, I think you might relate to this. Yeah, that means a lot. Cause I know the students who I would look at, it, I'm like, I don't know what's going on, but I'm, I'm going to give you what I can to let you know you're loved and you're here and I see you. And like, here's a book I think might help. Here's a book that might, you know, like that, that gift is big. Um, and I had young people write to me recently. I had a former student, you know, I, I remember the day you came in and gave me a book and you were like, this isn't supposed to be in the library. Don't tell anyone. And he wrote the day and came back and was like, I cried twice. So you, so like that idea of, I, I read this and I thought of you. I think it does a lot for a kid, man. No, that I, I 100% agree. And I'm very appreciative of all the educators who, were very, very intentional about what they put into their, um, their syllabi, um, just to kind of affirm that people that look like me, like you, like Kenny, like anybody who doesn't see themselves usually, you know, like as very, very appreciative. And um, I even really liked how much you talked about like that, how you balance um, being tender about these topics, but not filtering yourself too much um, and I think that's a very useful skill and a skill that I feel like writers and those who share um, like literary works to kind of balance in their head when they're kind of wrestling with, is this okay to bring in the classroom? But, you know, um, you know, you use poetry so beautifully to communicate a lot of these topics. Do you feel like there are other spaces maybe outside of the classroom that could intersect more with poetry? Like, are, are there spaces that like, uh, if, they started like hip hop and poetry, right? Is it like, what's the difference, right? In some ways, like, are there, do you, have you thought of other areas that could use a little poetry in their life? I mean, I think all areas can use poetry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I do, I do. I think there's something about the language of poetry and this, this, that cuts through a lot of the noise because of poetry's reliance on brevity, because poetry is trying to stay is trying to talk to a human experience in the least amount of words, right? That that is what makes a poem, the efficiency of language. And I think for a lot of us, you, you can carry a poem in the way you can't carry a novel. Like I might memorize a paragraph or two, but I can't, I'm not gonna memorize a whole 10 pages, but I could memorize 10 pages of poetry. I could drop a Lucille Clifton poem on any given day. You know what I mean? Because of what it means to me and how I hold it in my body. And so I'm, I'm very much about guerrilla poetry. I love when people just spit poetry on the train. I love when people just are on somebody's corner saying poems out loud, right? Because it disrupts where we think it can be. You know, I, I'm really interested in the ways that different kinds of competitions or scholarships, I love the first wave program, right? That it, 
it it very very clearly said we are going to create a program for poets and for hip hop, right? So I think that the way that we champion football teams and basketball teams and we recruit for those things. But I wanted to be poet laureate of my university. I was like, GW, what's up? I could be <laughs> I'm here saying poems, like, why not have a university poet laureate? Why not have these programs where we very clearly say, you know, the poet is in the world, they're in the society, they are as important as the diplomat, like, like we, we, from the youngest level, right, already create uh, the griots um, environment, that that is a space, the storytellers of our time matter just as much in in spaces that aren't necessarily the poetry cafe or or just the classroom. But I haven't given this question too much thought. And so I don't I, I don't feel like I have a concrete like, all right, so bring them to the UN and then bring them to Fifth Street and do that. <laughs> I don't have that, but um, everywhere. Like, where shouldn't it be? I guess is the better question. That was a beautiful response. Thank you. Um, and so we are close to wrapping up but we're gonna have our favorite section, my favorite section, the audience's favorite section, which is chop it up. For those of you that are new. Your favorite section. We're telling Ooh, what'd you say? I'm sorry, I don't know if I heard you, you know. <laughs> talking about the audience's favorite section. And we're telling them that, and cause it is. Um, yeah, but it's just fun questions that are difficult, um, that are so hard. Um, <laughs> I think we did get some hard ones in this time, but who knows? Oh my God, yeah. Uh, look, look, I almost want you to start just to see so, what you choose. Just the usual, you know, since it's chop it up, what do you get in salad? What do I get in a salad? <laughs> um, you know, I put a little bit of everything. I'm very much into balance. So something salt, something sweet, usually a little <laughs> like apple or a little like cranberry. That's the sweet. Um, something salty like a feta or olive. <laughs> a artichoke you know what I'm saying you need some texture you gotta get your pita chips or your tortilla chip um and then of course your base which I tend to go with like a mixed green or arugula because of the peppery um, <laughs> I'm at with it y'all not gonna ask me no food questions because I'm gonna have some answers <laughs> I know, I'm like trying to write this down <laughs> we look Milka Milka has asked what do you put in a salad for the last three joints and I think- you know I love Milka, first off. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm. this was, we don't usually put audience questions in our Chop It Up section, but I thought this was kind of interesting. Um, from Natalia Taran uh, of Oswego East High School in Oswego, Illinois. Shout out Illinois family. Yeah. Um, if you were in any plays or musicals in the past, what was your favorite role to play? I played Ariel in The Tempest. No. I... <laughs> huge Shakespeare fan I don't know what it was I like you know I had this teacher who said like you either you either read Shakespeare and you get it or you read it and you don't and I don't think that's how it works but it was it felt like a secret language in high school like nobody else could get I'm like y'all don't see what he's saying he's barring up y'all better start paying (laughs) I was I'm over here decoding it like I like I could translate Shakespeare so I've I'm just a fan of the bard right but the Tempest felt really dope particularly because it's about islands and at the time, I just remember reading Caliban and like the, you know, the spirits and how they're used. And I think there's so many allusions to the kind of post-colonial work that, that I try to do. So big fan of the Tempest. I was also in Tennessee Williams, The Rose Tattoo. I was also in Once on This Island. I was also in Working. Um, I was part of the Thespian Society in high school. All that to say, yeah, no, many, many plays. Um, I can't sing those so no musicals. What? Oh, never a musical? Oh, I wish, I wish, but no, I don't have a great voice. <laughs> well, maybe we'll see you next time, you know, maybe I'll see. I mean, yeah, Hamilton is out now, so it's just... <laughs> you, know, you, cannot, you cannot be in Hamilton. Yeah, it's like, Hamilton doesn't have to be the lane for every theater rapper, but... <sighs> I don't think I'm good in the career path I'm currently on. I'm going to be... Hold it down for us at, at Hamilton. <laughs> Funny. So our next question, which I hope Kenny follows up with the question I want to ask, what is your uh, best childhood comeback? What do you mean? Like clap back? Like what are you getting? What do you mean? <laughs> I'm talking like medium spicy, like like three peppers. 
like what but give me more give me an example because i could go somewhere um, you want to go somewhere i'm not supposed to go <laughs> yeah answer the question Monica. Mm. what best childhood comeback um i was not you know i didn't know you could reflect a, a top it up question back in <laughs> Like a clap back, like or like a yeah, a, yeah, a quick clap back, or got me, but ten years later, like that, or yeah, like you kind yeah. of with you in your purse, just wherever you went in case somebody tried to act funny. Oh yeah, no, I wasn't that kind of kid. I was mostly really quiet, and then, <laughs> until I very much wasn't, but it wasn't very um, poetic in any way, shape, or form. I would go home and write about it. And I'm like, I can't wait till they say something else. So I. <laughs> I can't That's even clap back, walk away, go home, write about it. Were you the one that you yelled in the shower in your head, just like, I would have said this, that? I'm going to be a National Book Award winner. You ain't nothing. Yeah, I'm one of those people who, like, is never going to get their comeuppance and, or who's never going to see the person get their comeuppance. So, like, I had a middle school bully, and I'm like, yo, I know, I know one day, like, we're going to get this moment back and like, I'll get, you know, time will avenge me for all the time. She made fun of me in gym and made fun of me in my big toe and made fun, you know, and girl, no, she got like a hundred thousand followers. She out here living her best life in Miami. I'm like, the world is just, this is what my comeback story was like. <laughs> it was just oh an empty bag that I could pull nothing from and the universe honors what it honors. And I'm okay with that. <laughs> That's fair. That's good. You're too funny. Oh my gosh. Um, okay. I think this is our last one. Um, I'm, I'm hoping I'm not going to do the one Milka ones. I feel <laughs> as if, okay, uh, because we are in the holiday season and because you already said you wanted food, most underrated holiday food. Um, so I thought it was interesting that Milka said lasagna as a holiday food, cause it's not often considered a holiday food, but Dominican, my mom makes lasagna. <laughs> <laughs> And so that's my holiday food, which is underrated. We also make codfish fritters, which are amazing. Hey, yes, I, 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 I didn't. It was my. <laughs> hey. No, they're great, and I don't even mess with codfish like that. But codfish fritters, though, don't do that. Um, but I don't know. I love going down south with my husband's family, and I, the corn corned beef hash was something that I tried for the first time in North Carolina. I was like, yo, this is popping. Why? <laughs> whatever this is, and how whatever it's made, I'm with it. So I'm gonna go with the corned beef hash. You never. I feel like that's good black food. Is like I don't know how this is made, and maybe I don't need to. Maybe that's where the magic is at. Uh, <laughs> um, thank you so much to Elizabeth Acevedo for joining us. We are gonna make sure she gets out of here and has time to eat. Um, mm. go purchase her books. I found Clap When You Land. I couldn't find it at first. Um, and obviously, uh, the fire on high as well. And then keep up to date with her at Acevedo Writes. Um, real quick, before we get out of here, we're going to bring Brian up to make some announcements to do boring Brian. Boring Brian things. Look at me. See, I'm stuttering because I'm mean. I I oh, be well, folks. Be safe. Be safe. Be safe. Be well. I can't.